Europe Out Loud, a podcast about Europe's history, culture and civilization. Brought to you by the Martin Center with Frederico Reo. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Europe Out Loud, our podcast series that tries to bring European culture and history to bear on problems of contemporary EU politics and policy. So today I am delighted to welcome on the platform Professor Calypso Nicolaidis, who is uh, at the moment chair at the School of Transnational Governance of the European University Institute in Florence on leave from the University of Oxford, where she has taught for a long time. Calypso, welcome. Thank you, Federico. It's my pleasure to be with you. I do want to mention actually your latest book, which is on Brexit out of all topics, and it's uh, Exodus Reckoning, Sacrifice, Three Meanings of Brexit. And I have to say I was very impressed by it because it's, a, it's an interpretation of Brexit uh, through some of the founding myth on Western culture. So um, um, I, unfortunately, we, we probably don't have time to delve deeply into this book because the idea of the podcast was more to um, sort of uh, discuss another important aspect of your scholarly work, which is the, um, the prospects and the nature of transnational democracy in the European Union. And of course, we know that this is very topical, you know, in a year where um, the much delayed conference on the future of Europe is, um, is set uh, to begin. And an important part of that conversation will also have to do with uh, the legitimacy of the Union, which was uh, under heavy strain, as we know, in the last decade, and what type of democracy do we want for the future of Europe? And you are you have been, I think, the pioneer in, in the scholarly literature of a, a way of thinking about transnational democracy, particularly with regard to the EU, which you have called democracy. Uh, of course, the reference is to the plural of demos, uh, demoi. And therefore, um, uh, what you have described as a union of peoples who govern together, but not as one. And therefore, I mean, let's start from the basics. Um, I would ask you, what do you mean? What What is a democracy and why should people, policymakers, you know, practitioners uh, who are preparing now the Conference of the Future of Europe and thinking about this topic, why should they care? Why is it relevant? Well, first of all, thank you, Federico, for this very kind introduction. Um, I, I think this is really a moment when we uh, want to both be very concrete vis-a-vis European citizens in how we can make the European Union more legitimate. But uh, paradoxically, being concrete also requires some conceptual frames, some ways of thinking. And um, this idea of Europe as a democracy, interestingly, came to me when I was part of the the last convention in 2001-3 as part of the Greek delegation as a Sherpa and part of the Presidium Um, And one of the things I was doing there was to um, help coordinate the so-called Friends of the Community Method, which were the smaller states, small and medium states, um, who had a particular view on institutional reform. And I asked myself, you know, what kind of vision of Europe legitimizes and strengthens the, um, the claim of these smaller states that they need to have to continue to have enough power in the EU, you know, whether it's the rotating presidency, the commissioner, the weighing of votes, as they've had until now. And there was a big push, you know, by big member states to actually assert their power. I, I had called this at the time the Gulliver syndrome. Um, and, and the reason, and, and so slowly thinking about this, um, First of all, that we had to make clear again and again that if the EU is a peace project, it is a peace project that is anti-hegemonic inside. That is, it was constructed institutionally to make sure that no big state, no Napoleon or Hitler or anyone will march in another state and swallow them up. And so it's a, it was built against hegemony. And how do you build against hegemony, against horizontal domination between states? The, well, the first important call is to value diversity, not just the diversity of cultures and languages in Europe. Everyone pays lip service to diversity uh, in that sense, but political diversity, constitutional diversity. And the idea that um, 
each state, each group of people that has a, a social and political contract under a state uh, needs to uh, be recognized and that states need to work with each other horizontally. And that indeed, um, to do that, you need the glue of common institutions, but they should not overwhelm the states. Um, and, and so this was my first and big concern. And, and, and from that, from this concern for small state, from pluralism and for building a Europe that would not be defined against some other, that doesn't become a state in the making, uh, that needs another because every nation state needs another, whether it's Islam, whether it's the US, whether it's China. I didn't like that kind of Europe. Um, so with these kinds of concern in mind, I looked at the convention floor, I looked at the debate, and I found that yet again, the EU debate was organized in binary ways, always mm. bi the binaries. Um, and and this tyranny of binaries, Federico, you and I agree that has continued to this day. So often the EU is framed as you have the federalist versus the sovereignist. And I thought, how can we conceptually get out of this binary, which is not very productive. We're not gonna build Europe by pitting half of the city against citizens against the other half, half of the right. political parties against the other half. And this is how I came to the idea that we need to frame a third way. So the most important thing about democracy, the Europe of a union of peoples, it, that is, is a third way. It, it puts a, it, it emphasizes the peoples against the notion of Europe being built as a federal state, as a state in the making. But it also, very importantly, certainly not a sovereignist reification right. of the state or of an ethnic people. It's simply saying, you know, the beauty of Europe is it makes peoples, citizens intermingle horizontally, not just talking to Brussels, but know each other, respect each other, legal empathy, uh, uh, engage with each other's laws and policies and political processes. And the EU is supposed to make this more and more intense. That's the understanding, uh, democratic understanding of ever closer union. It's a horizontal, first and foremost, idea of intermingling and recognition. It is not a denial of the need for supranationalism, for the glue that makes this happen, but it puts the horizontal governing together, togetherness, first and foremost. Thanks, thanks, Calypso, for emphasizing you know, the importance of finding a third way. As you know, this is something that I myself, and I, I can say I think the Martin Center has been quite engaged in. We also think that it is absolutely um, essential. Also, the, the, uh, the, the centrality of protecting the small states, which is often missed you know, in, the, in the constitutional debate. And in many ways, I think even some of the reforms of the Lisbon Treaty and the trends that we have seen uh, in recent uh, years have, have not necessarily gone in the right uh, um, direction there. Um, let me zoom in for a moment on the implications of all this for some of the discussions about EU legitimacy and democracy that we have been having and to an extent we are still having. Um, because it seems to me that they have been framed mostly with the model of parliamentary, national parliamentary democracy in mind. And we have been trying to transfer uh, that model to the European level uh, with a variety of innovations, very interesting, and to an extent some of them even successful. I mean, of course, uh, we have strengthened, uh, rightly so, I think, that the powers of the European Parliament. And then over the last uh, um, uh, 10 years or so, we have also tried to experiment with new um, institutional innovation, such as the Spitzenkandidaten process, for example, as a way to parliamentarize FADA, uh, the union. And now we are discussing, well, we have been discussing for a while, transnational lists. So your framework of um, um, democracy, what does it imply in terms of the role of the European Parliament and proposals such as the transnational lists or realities, in fact, because we have already experienced twice with the system of the, the Spitzenkandidaten. So, I mean, Federico, first of all, I, I totally recognize that the Martin Institute and your own work and many um, and, and others, you know, um, actually uh, believe in this vision of a third way, which is not just an in-between, which is a very negative way of describing. So it's, it's trying to say, I mean, it's important for people listening to us that, you know, because it's, it's commonplace to simply say the EU is between a 
an alliance and a super, an international organization and a federation. No, it's more than that. A third way means that the other two are closer to each other than that third way. And they're closer to each other. And that's a way to respond to your question because they, uh, whether you see this, the nation states of the main locus or Europe, if you if this European Federation uh, state in the making simply reproduces national institutions at a higher level. And that's what we want to avoid. Now, how do you do this while strengthening European institution? And that's and there are two two kind of answers to this. First of all, that um, we need to have democracy all the way down. In fact, Europe may become more democratic than its member state if it takes seriously the idea that it can be a democracy for the long term, so that it has some advantages actually democratically. Um, you know, there are three sources of democracy, of, of legitimacy in a, in a polity. There is the, the story, the narrative. Europe has it, but the narrative of peace has run its course. Um, we need to rethink the, the kind of mission of Europe. The, the output, well, it goes up and down in cycle. You can't really always rely on it. So the main core source of legitimacy is for citizens to feel that they own this union, that it's co-developed by them. But not just because once in five years they vote for the European Parliament, not just because their national leader sits around the table, because after all, he or she might sit around the table, but where's the opposition? Where's the transparency? Where's the blood, the life of democratic um, debate around the council? It doesn't happen enough. What we need is, is a democratic life form in the EU. And so, so if we've said that, if we've said that democratic legitimacy requires a way of having transnational conversations on the big issues of the day. Then indeed, coming to the second layer, the specific institutions, your question, Federico, about the European Parliament, the European Parliament has a crucial role to play. As long as it doesn't reproduce, try to just be like any old national parliament. It is itself a democratic space, a space where peoples, not just from countries, but from cities, regions, from all sorts of spaces, as well as from different ideologies, and that's back to your word, you know, um, converse and decide, not just, it's not just a conversation space, but a, a decision space, but that space has to be second degree. It brings pre-existing debates at these other levels together. And this is why, indeed, I very strongly believe that transnationalists are very democratic, would be a very democratic reform because they would be a way for citizens of, of one country to be much more exposed to citizens of another as candidates, as voters for other nationalities. And it happens a bit these days, but certainly not radically enough. In fact, a democratic approach to all of these questions is more radical than a statist, a national uh, uh, the, transforming the EU into one old, good old, new federal state like the United States. It's much more complicated and demanding to ask, you know, a Spanish citizens to take in what it means mm -hmm. to be Lithuanian and German and Greek than simply to say, you know, relate more to Brussels or be one people. Um, so, yes, totally for transnationalists. Um, whether the Spitzen candidate in and of itself um, is the best way of creating this transnational debate is, um, a, is not something you can answer just like that. You have to ask, as we do as good old social scientists, under what condition? Under what condition does this create more transnational debate, intermingling debate? And so for me, it's not, it's not the most important part of the story. It's, it's interesting, Calypso, that you would uh, speak so favorably of transnational lists because my, my sort of judgment tends to be a little bit more cautious, but I'm interesting in your, in, in, interested in your sort of point of view there because it seems to me that there is a risk of excessive dominance of big member states in the case of transnational lists. This is one of the objections that have been raised against it, right? I mean, candidates from, in, in these lists from big member states would obviously have 
um, be favored over candidates from a small states of 500,000 uh, um, inhabitants like, uh, like uh, Luxembourg, for example. You, you don't see that risk. I see that risk and I share with you, Federico, that when we analyze politics and political reform, uh, we need to look at the whole spectrum of lists and opportunity. And in fact, the conversation we're having is both about the EU as it is, because it isn't more Christian in the making, but also about its flaws, about the temptations um, to make it different, um, about the fact that um, it's one thing to talk about institutions, but it's another to talk about the underlying social realities of Europe and how mm. European policies you know, need to respect mm. uh, all the different circumstances of European citizens and all of the progress that we still need to work on in the EU. So, you know, I believe in tough love. I believe that the EU needs to be embraced, but also criticized in very passionate, equally passionate ways on both sides. So this is a, a roundabout way to say that, yes, you know, transnational lists, um, if they're done the good old way, they could just be counterproductive. Um, but this is why it, they need to come with a spirit. You know, a spirit that sometimes, you know, I say that the soul of Europe is, is in its smaller state and it's in, in its peripheries, you know, from from Palermo to Helsinki to to Lisbon to um, Thessaloniki. And um, I, I would love for mm -hmm. a European debate for the, the more bigger states to kind of embrace the beauty and the reality of the smaller, less powerful state. And I can imagine a, a list, you know, being run by a, a bunch of young people from um, from all of these peripheries. And why wouldn't they, you know, be, be campaigning at the so-called center of the uh, and and charm the hell out of the citizens of you know Germany and France? I know, Federico. I imagine you're going to, you know, tell me how you're hopelessly naive and idealistic, Philip. So. But what I'm trying to say is that we have to have imagined political imagination and imagine what, you know, the potentialities in mm -hmm. can be. No, I think you are right on the contrary. And I think that indeed the deficit of imagination is one of the problems we always face when we're trying to think about the future of EU democracy. And democracy is in, indeed an imaginative um, step forward, I think, in, in that sense. Uh, but this brings me to a, an issue that I wanted to raise. Um, one thing I always try to do in this podcast is to ground whatever we are discussing historically as much as possible. And therefore, I want to ask you uh, to ground as much as possible democracy historically, because if I have to tell you honestly what, what I feel when I read your work or some of the other sort of uh, uh, leading theoreticians of, demo of democracy, I see re-emerging in a very modernized form, meaning democratized form, a, a very traditional way of thinking about the unity of Europe as a soft unity, as a community of peoples, more than a, a centralized entity in the making that we have seen in the history of our continent in uh, uh, several key points. You could quote medieval Christendom, you could quote the Holy Roman Empire. You know that in my DIFU project, I am, I am looking a bit um, into that or even the concept of Europe to an extent. So is, is democracy a brilliant invention by a group of social scientists over the last 20 years? Or is this the emergence of, I would say, almost a European tradition of federalism that is more decentralized, more bottom-up, more anti-centralist compared to the tradition that is always dominant in our federalist imagination, which is the American um, experience? How, how do you position democracy from this point of view? Uh, Federico, you've said it better than I could, uh, which is indeed that in, in, in some ways, you know, we political forms uh, evolve and change. It's like a spiral. It's not like a circle. You know, we don't come to the same reality. But indeed, there's always the same tension. And in European history, um, as you were just now alluding to, in some ways, we've, we've had an oscillation. We've had a cycle where you've, you've had imperio, you know, starting with the Romans and, and, and continuing at different times of European history with 
uh, from the Pope to individual uh, emperors and, and often the result of individual countries wanting somehow to conquer the continent. And against this risk of imperial, you had always a development of, well, of course, you had increasingly the assertions of, of individual states and uh, the development of this idea that to create stability in the system, you need balance of power. So in the 17th, 18th century, you know, the theor theorists of peace and practitioner of peace thought, no, 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 we, we can't accept the imperial, but we should always find a way to have a balance of power. And indeed, in the 19th century, we had the successor of the Holy Roman Empire. I mean, the concert of Europe, extending success. You had an incarnation of that. But of course, what was the problem all along? Is <laughs> The problem is they weren't in back in the future, as if, if we could put it that way. That is that all of these notions and this constant oscillation between too much centralization and too little, and therefore war and reaction and counter reaction, um, you could say two things happen. One is that in the 20th century, uh, we've experienced the, the huge damage of this oscillation of trying to be one and of resisting not in a nationalist way against being one. And so we are again trying to find this third way but why, yes, the Holy Roman Empire and such might be inspirations, but they're not enough. And why we need conceptual innovation is that, you know, the 19th century was the time when it disappeared, was the time when something else appeared, which was democratic struggles. Exactly, yeah. and, that, and, and, and in fact, democratic struggle against these kings sitting around the table agreeing on each other on the balance of power in Europe, like they now do in the council. And people saying, we exist, we exist. And kings resi resisting and saying, well, no, 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 we're still going to co-opt each other against what you're trying to do. And so where we are now, you know, 200 years later, is simply at a time where democracy has established itself with all the flaws and all the difficulties that we experience now in our democratic stories. What, where we are now is that we all have to invent at every level democracy all the way down. Then this is my most important, you know, obsession when it comes to grounding the legitimacy of the EU and of its member states, because the two go together, is that, yes, it's the good old story of an, a third way in equilibrium, but grounded in on democratic legitimacy all the way down. So the sitting together around tables has to be done by the peoples. And the beauty of today is that we have technology to do that. And when we're preparing the conference on the future of Europe, you know, we're all talking, having intense conversations about how to use technology, technological platforms, um, panels, citizens panels and consultation not just to say something to Europe when you're never quite sure what, whether Brussels is going to use it, but for people to communicate across borders. And I'm sure you see that too, Federico, but the new generation, they know how to do that. Young people know how to do that. So, so my, my roundabout answer to your question is there is a very nice, complex, you know, historical story there about precedent and and that which inspired Kant to write beautifully about the third way. My last article but was, was how he's appropriate, Kant is appropriated by the Definitely. current EU. But at the same time, we are in a radically different context, democratic context. So both things are true at the same time. Yes, indeed. I, I entirely agree with you. Um, I would like to maybe um, ask you for a moment, Calypso, now to really get concrete and specific. To an extent, you have already done that. Uh, if you were to advise the Conference on the Future of Europe about the democratic reform of the EU, I know that you believe that the EU, in, to, to a large extent, is already a democracy. But I know that you also think that the EU has not lived up to its democratic potential, and that more needs to be done to, to fully realize that. So what are the key reforms of the EU in a democratic direction that you would advocate? Well, first of all, Federico, it would be a bit self-contradictory me, for me to come up with a menu when um, my big belief and in engagement these days is indeed to try to think with many people, including you and, and many others, on how to, uh, to ameliorate mm -hmm. Europe's um, 
democratic credentials, democratic participation, citizens empowerment. And, and so partly if you believe in process, you can't just come up, oh, I'm this academic, I'm sitting in my ivory tower and here is my five reforms you know, of the institutions, of policies. I mean, I've worked, I've written extensively how monetary union could be more democratic, you know, migration. We'll come to that later on, yeah. Yeah, but, but the point is that, you know, every policy mm. can be better grounded in, um, in both, in, in autonomy at various levels, in, in recognition, in non-domination, there's very concrete policy consequences. But for me, my, my biggest commitment is what, in fact, we're trying to do at EUI with our EUI Democracy Forum, is to think through uh, ways of reconciling, you know, effectiveness and inclusion in democratic participation. And it's not just, you know, Federico, um, institutional magic bullets, you know, such committee of the European Parliament or creating a, a parliament of parliaments, as many continue to speak about. I think that actually indeed would be very important to to you know, build up on COSAC and, 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 and on, on mm. the hundreds of articles and books that have been written on national parliaments in the EU. Absolutely, institutionally, that's very important, making the council more transparent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly is, to, is an ethos and a praxis. You know, it, I think of institutions as in the middle uh, of above them an ethos, a mindset of people involved, and under them a praxis. And you can have all you know the institutions in the world, but if the ethos and praxis is not democratic, then it's not going to happen. One good example is the European Citizens Initiative, which we had in right. the Lisbon Treaty. It's in the text because the ethos was that these were a bit of a pain in the neck. Then, out of fifty-four, you know, uh, close to sixty now. You know, we mo almost 50, 50 were rejected uh, by the commission. It was a headache. Instead mm. of the commission saying, oh, wow, isn't it amazing? Look at all these young people who, instead of going dancing or getting drunk or going in festival, they're spending all their lives, you know, on <laughs> behind tables in the street or in the markets getting signatures for an ECI. We're so happy. They're so involved. We're going to make their life as easy as possible. We're going to give them access. No, that was not the mindset. What's going on here? So this is where I call for a change in ethos and a change of praxis that, need, that is as important as a change in institution. And that's why what people like you or me and many, many others uh, um, should work on. And that's what we are trying to do with EUI. That's why and then the School of Transnational Governance and with coalitions of NGOs, including our friends at the Citizens Takeover Europe Coalition of NGOs. And, and many others, the, the Civil Society Convention. Um, there's so many amazing initiatives, Federico. I, I think it's super exciting. We're living in a very, very exciting time. There's an effervescence. The question will be whether EU institutions and EU leaders listen. And you know, we're seeing in France with the Climate Convention, we're seeing all sorts of experiments at the national level. Will we draw the, the positive and negative lessons from these experiments and expand them at the EU level? Indeed, uh, Calypso, I agree with you once more. I'm afraid there won't be a lot of contradiction in this debate mm -hmm. because we know we, we tend to agree about many things. Um, that is, uh, this is very fascinating. I'm afraid that probably we are running over time and we need to wrap it up and bring it to a close. We could continue forever and hopefully mm -hmm. we will continue uh, in, in future sort of context and fora. Uh, it's always a pleasure to discuss with you, Calypso. I, I will not try to conclude sort of the, the, the exchange, the conversation. I will just wish you all the best for the work that you will continue to do on these topics because I think they're they are all very, very relevant. And, um, and I hope that also there will be more engagement with these ideas on the side of practitioners and policy uh, makers and to an extent, well, the effort of this podcast is also to help bring this important concept of democracy to fruition to a more policy um, environment. So thank you very much for being uh, with us, Calypso, and uh, hopefully we'll continue the conversation. My pleasure. It was a uh, real pleasure to talk with you, Federico, and indeed there are many more um, avenues that um, we can discuss and we will continue hopefully in the very near future.
Um, uh, and I want to say um, at the end of the day, I'm, an, I'm very much an optimist on the future of the European Union. You mentioned at the beginning that I uh, did write a book about Brexit. Um, I, I, I think that Brexit um, is completely undervalued in what it has done for European democracy, that we need to thank the British people for demonstrating that you can leave the EU. The EU is not a prison. And therefore, you can leave the EU and therefore you shouldn't, precisely because it's not a prison. And that's what I meant by sacrifice. It's as if this country that will lose a lot by leaving the EU has sacrificed itself to demonstrate the nature of the EU polity. Um, so this is one of the many things I try to, the, the provocations I try to offer um, in this book. Uh, my next book that's coming out, you know, in a, in, in a month is indeed about, it's called The Citizen's Guide to the Rule of Law with my friend Addis. And um, it's, it takes on some of these topics that you left open at the end, uh, very much, very forceful in, um, in trying to say that at the end of the day, the EU is a community of law. Um, it is only as strong as um, the, the rule of law respect in its member states and only as strong as the health of its national and urban democracies. It is a patchwork of, of all of this. And so it's in the interest of the EU and of all of its citizens to ensure that democracy is alive and well, the rule of law is alive and well, not just in their neighborhood, not just in their capital and in their city and in their country, but around Europe, because we're all interconnected. Thank you, Calypso. We'll look forward to reading your, your new book. And I really advise everyone who has an interest in Brexit to read uh, your Brexit book, because it's a, it's a breath of fresh air. And it has a lot to do also with our discussion on democracy. Thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you. That was today's episode of Europe Out Loud. Subscribe to our podcasts for more.